All right, so as many of you guys know, I'm a big uh, comedy fan. I'm not saying that means I'm funny, I'm just saying I like comedy. Sometimes we enjoy enjoying the gifts that we don't have, right? And so I like to watch comedians and listen to comedians. Um, and I am of the opinion that South African comedians are the funniest in the world, and I'll go to the grave with that. Um, you can fight me on it, I'm right, okay? South African comedians are just the funniest in the world. And so growing up, a lot of my favorite people, like my favorite celebrities, were South African comedians. Um, and so one day, I got a phone call from a friend of mine, um, and he knew some people, you know, in the industry or whatever, uh, and he invited me to be an extra on a taping of what is kind of like the South African equivalent of Saturday Night Live. So think about Saturday Night Live, and then think about it as not as good, okay? That, that's what I got invited to be a part of. Um, and there was rumors going around that two of my favorite comedians were gonna be uh, a part of that show, that they were, I was gonna get to meet them. I was super excited. And so I got there, I got, it was like an old timey thing. I wore like a wig and uh, it doesn't matter, uh, but it was fun. Um, and then they came in and I got so excited that the rumors were true and I got to meet these two guys who I just thought were so smart and so funny and so hilarious and just seemed like such genuine people. And so I was really excited to, to be in the presence of these guys. Um, and so I met the first one. It's a guy by the name of Chris Forrest. I use his name because my grandmother loves him. Um, and so, yes, you do. Yes, you do. She knows him. Sorry. Sorry. She doesn't just love him. She knows him as well. <laughs> Um, and so I got to meet him and like full disclosure, like he completely met all of my expectations. This guy was, was hilarious, he was kind, he was charming, he, he sat and like gave time to everyone when he wasn't filming, he was talking to extras, I saw him playing with some of the like kids who were, like he just was the best, he was such a nice guy. Um, and then I met the second guy uh, and uh, well, that was disappointing, to say the least. Not because he wasn't a nice guy. He was actually very sweet, very kind. We talked a lot. He was as clever as I thought he was going to be. But the truth is, he just wasn't funny, which is weird, right? Because he's like a hilarious comedian. But we were sitting in conversation, and every joke he made was bad, like awkward bad, like what's happening right now. You know what I mean? You know, like when someone makes a joke, and they think they were funny, and everyone else knows they weren't, and so one really nice person goes, <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Luis knows what I'm talking about. Like that was happening to a famous comedian, one of the top South African comedians. And so I left that interaction, as you can imagine, feeling incredibly disappointed. Um, and we all need that friend, that friend who has no social understanding or social awareness and will ask the questions that no one else dares, right? And so I was lucky enough to have my one of those friends with me that day, and she straight up said to this guy, hey, you're not very funny in person. And his response was interesting. He said, I know. That was the first funny thing he said all day, right? And so this started a really interesting conversation with these two comedians, and they, they were very generous. They shared their process with us. Chris Forrest is just the kind of guy who's naturally funny. He doesn't write many of his jokes down. He kind of has, like, loose ideas, and he gets up on stage, and he's really good at inter... He's just a naturally funny guy. Whereas this other guy is more introverted, and he's a genius. And so when you give him a pen and paper and time in an empty room, he's able to tap into a comedic genius that I myself will never have access to. And that's where he becomes hilarious, right? And it was just so interesting to be able to hear the two different perspectives of these guys and to appreciate just the breadth of God's genius in the way that he creates us all differently. Um, and the reason why I'm telling you this story has very little to do with what we're going to talk about today. Um, but what it did remind me of is how I often feel when I read the book of Genesis. I often read the book of Genesis and we read through the stories of like these faith giants like Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob. And we go into it like thinking back to what we learned in Sunday school and kids church. And we like in our minds, these guys were great. They were awesome. Man, they were stalwarts of the faith. And I'm not saying they weren't, but what I am saying is so often when I read the stories of Genesis, I walk away feeling just very disappointed in who, who we meet. And the truth is today, as we read Genesis 27, we are going to run into the fact that every single character in this story sucks. We're allowed to say that in America, right? Is that a swear word? Did I, did I offend someone? Okay. 
we're going to read this story and you're going to look for like a shining light. You know, someone who is like an example of faithfulness, someone who you can like restore your hope in humanity and you're not going to find it. Every single person that we read about in Genesis 27 make up this, this dysfunctional family filled with self-centered, short-sighted, and self-serving people who all in their own way do everything they can in this story to thwart the redemptive history that God was trying to unfold in front of them. Every single one of them allowed their own agenda to get in the way of what God had already told them he was going to do. And as we do that, we are going to come face to face with one really scary truth and one really glorious truth. The one really scary truth that we're going to come face to face with is we're not all that different. The one really scary truth that we're going to come face to face with is we're going to realize that we are not very different from the four people we're about to read about. But the one really glorious truth that we're going to read about today is that it's not us who dictates the redemptive history of God, of, of Yahweh. What we're going to learn about today is that the plans of God cannot be thwarted, not even by our own sinfulness. What we're going to learn about today is that what God has decreed, which is to bring a Savior into the world through the line of Abraham, who would die on behalf of sinners and give them his righteousness so that his Holy Spirit could come and dwell in us and make us more like him so that day by day we would be transformed from one degree of glory to another so that through us the world can know this God, that eventually he would return and make all things new, that that plan has been set in place and is guaranteed and not your sin sinfulness or mine could get in the way of that. That no matter how sinful you think you are, no matter how broken you think you are, no matter how shameful you think your past is, if God has determined to love you, he will love you. And that the glorious truth that you want to walk away with today, if you forget everything else I said, is that God keeps those whom he loves. God keeps those whom he loves. And so let's open up to Genesis 27. Um, it seems like Dave really loves giving his elders the entire chapters to preach. Um, and so we're going to jump through that whole chapter today. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim that he could not see, he called Esau, his oldest son, and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, Isaac is a very interesting character up until this point, right? If we think back to this history, we know that Isaac has, for the most part, been pretty faithful to God, right? Isaac has proven himself, for the most part, to be pretty faithful to God. We have seen Isaac uh, remain obedient to the point of laying down on an altar, trusting that somehow God would make a way for him not to be sacrificed by his own dad. We saw him patient in submitting to the process that God had laid out in front of him to bring him a wife. And, and we also see that he was a peacemaker who humbly made a way to live in peace with the Philistines rather than be goaded into their foolish quibbles. And he has shown himself to be the kind of person who regularly and readily communes with God and enters into the presence of God. He's shown himself to be a man who knows God. Right now, this is obviously avoiding the, you know, that one time when he repeated a pattern that his father re regularly, uh, but we, that's fine. God is gracious. Isaac, for the most part, has been very faithful. But now, what we see is later on in his life, he's lost his sight. He's getting older. His back probably hurts, right? And what we see is that Isaac's faith begins to wane. But what I want us to hold in tension here is that Isaac is still a genuine believer, a sincere Christian who I believe genuinely loves God, who has genuinely experienced God, who genuinely has the Spirit living in and through him. This is a Christian, a genuine, sincere, saved man. And it's important that we bear this in mind as we continue in the story. Now, many of us, when we read this, at first, might think to ourselves, Mitchell, why are you, being, you know, why are you about to be hard on Isaac? He didn't do anything wrong, right? Because in Jewish tradition, it would make sense, right, to call in the oldest son 
and bless the oldest son. What this blessing was, was giving the, the, the patriarchal authority of that family over to the firstborn son, giving him command over all of the younger siblings, giving him command over all of the wealth of the family, giving him the reins of the future of that family. And Esau was, in fact, the firstborn son, right? And so is Isaac doing anything wrong? Yes, we should all proclaim, because we know that just a couple of verses before this in Genesis 25, God prophesied to Rebekah that the younger would be, would, would be served by the older, that the younger would be the one to have authority over the older. God had already spoken clearly to this family, saying that Jacob was to be the one who would be blessed by his father. And then, later on, we see that Esau, the very faithful guy that he is, happily gives his birthright away for a bowl of soup. For a bowl of soup. Right? So Isaac knows what God has prophesied. He has also witnessed the character of his older son. Not only did Esau give up his birthright for a bowl of soup, a bowl of soup. I don't know. I feel like you guys are not. He gave away everything for a single meal. It's wild. But he also had married two Gentile women. Now he knew that it was through his bloodline that the Messiah was supposed to come. Anyone who knows that the Messiah is supposed to come through the Jewish bloodline would know that marrying Gentiles would thwart that which shows that he had an indifferent heart at the very least to the plans of God for his family. And it kind of gives us some insight into what God was thinking when he said, I think the the younger should be served by the older. So not only did Isaac scoff in the face of God's prophecy, but he also looked at the, at the, the character of his son and decided that this is still a man who I should give the leadership of my family to. Now there are two possibilities that we could consider him. The first one, they're both bad. Okay, I just want to, let's just get on the same page here. The first one is that Isaac genuinely just did not regard God's prophecy at all, right? That he looked at that and thought to himself, ah, what does God know? Esau's cooler than Jacob, right? He's hairy. Who's going who's gonna to follow a smooth man? We gotta get the hairy guy in there. Everyone follows the hairy guy. Everyone knows that, right? Right? That's why I grew this mustache. (laughs) Or the second possibility is that God spoke through Rebecca and Isaac was mistrustful of the word of a woman. Now both of those are bad. And both of those reveal something about the character of Isaac. And both of those are prevalent in our culture today. We live in a culture, first and foremost, that very often likes the end goal of where God wants to take us to, but we really hate how he wants us to get there. Right? What, you want me to get there by sacrificing? You want me to get there by giving up all my worldly treasures and and serving up treasures in heaven? You know? We know the will of God. We don't always like how he wants us to get there. And so we stare in the face of of the obvious leading of God in our lives and we say, I'm going to do something different because I don't want to do what you're calling me to do. And the second thing that we do far too often, particularly in America and particularly in Texas, is that we do not take the words of our sisters seriously as we should. If we, for the last hundred years, heeded the call of the women in the church who were pointing us to the gross misuse of male power that has been unleashed on the church, that has seen people abused, that has seen people hurt, that has seen our witness broken in so many lives, we could have avoided the pain and the carnage that we've seen in the wake of church too and all of those kinds of movements. I'm saying that there is a right and good place to interpret what scripture says about eldership in the church. We are a complementarian church. But being a complementarian does not mean being a sexist. 
Being a complementarian means believing that God created men and women with equal value and equal dignity and equal gifting. And we believe that when we look back right onto creation, that when man needed help, God did not create a male elder board for him. He created a woman. Because we cannot achieve the mission of God as just men or just women. We complement. It's, it's in the name. We complement one another. A church led only by men is an unfaithful church. A church that takes seriously the voices of only men is an unfaithful church. A church that only heeds male voices, that only platforms male voices, a church that only disciples, trains, and builds men is a church that scoffs in the face of the God who created complementarianism in the first place. And so at Icon, we don't want to just disciple men, we want to disciple women. At Icon, we don't want to just give theological training to our men, but we want to see our women. We want to see women with PhDs here. I want to be told what to do by women, because I need to be told what to do by women, because I am an idiot. <laughs> if I did the stuff I wanted to do, and Amber had not warned me to not do those things, it would be a disaster. And so let us not be like Isaac, who disregards the prophecy of God because of who it came through. But let us be a people who dignify both men and women, who platform both men and women, knowing that is the image of God that lives equally in both of us, and if we silence one of them, we're silencing God himself. Amen? Amen. Okay. So what we see from Isaac is that he loves his favorite son more than he loves the will of God. And we can see that, in some ways, Isaac is living kind of through Esau, right? Isaac sees Esau as this athletic hunter guy, knows how to kill game. Ah, is that, I don't hunt, so I don't know. Is that, that we don't do that? Okay. Well, he's living through Esau, vicariously through him, because Esau is what every person at that time would want to be leading their family. But what dynamic does this create in the household? I mean, think about it. If Isaac is so intent on his favorite being given the blessing that he so clearly does not deserve, how must that have played out in the everyday lives of this family? Can you imagine how Jacob must have felt? Unloved, unworthy, not good enough, not strong enough always trying to be as good as his brother, but never being able to because, well, he's not his brother. Being too smooth. Jacob was not taken seriously by his own dad. And what we see in this passage as we think of this word blessing is that this, this passage, and actually the whole of, of, the, of the, the, this, this culture assumes that, that symbolic gestures like the giving of a blessing carries with it the, 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 nece the necessary power to shape what someone views themselves as. What this passage is assuming is that symbolic gestures like a blessing has the ability to, to, to change the trajectory of someone's life and change their view of their own identity. And what we're going to see all the way till the end of Jacob's life is that this theme of desperately desiring the blessing of his father becomes the theme of his life. Everything that we see Jacob doing from this point onward is to be approved of, affirmed, loved, validated, cared for by his dad. That's right. And I don't think that it's all that different for many of us sitting here today. Now, it might not be your dad in particular. We live in a world where all of us desire to be affirmed, loved, cared for, validated, seen, and heard. I love the way that Tim Keller puts it. Tim Keller says that all of us have in our heart the desire for someone who is uniquely valuable to tell us that we are uniquely valuable to them. All of us have a desire in our hearts 
to have someone who is uniquely valuable tell us that we are uniquely valuable to them. I'm aware that there are some of us in this room who this person is their dad. Either you didn't know your dad growing up, or you did, and this was very much your experience, that you were to be seen but not heard, that you were never good enough for his expectations of you, that he never affirmed you, never encouraged you, told you he loved you, he was proud of you. For some of us in this room, maybe it was your mom. Maybe your mom had standards for you that were way too high for you to reach. For some of us, maybe we didn't know our parents. And so it was living for the approval of, of, of symbolic parents who we might have never met or never come to meet and could never get their approval of. For some of us, it wasn't single people, but the world. Some of us grew, grew up or are still living our lives to hear from someone you are uniquely valuable to me. So some of us are, are breaking our backs to get straight A's in high school so that someone will tell us that they're proud of us. And then they do, but then you get to college and then you realize, man, I need to hear that again. So I need to, I need to get straight A's again. And then maybe you do, and it seems like they're less impressed this time than they were the first time, right? But you still get the A's and you're like, cool, I got this sweet job now, I'm finally... People are going to be proud of me. And now no one cares, right? Because you're supposed to get a job. That's what, just what you're supposed to do. So then you think, oh, if I get a certain price range and I buy a certain car or get a certain size house, the world will take notice of me. And then either you don't, which is just crushing in and of itself, or you do, and you realize that that big house and that big car are emptier than you could have ever imagined them being. Because we realize that every time we get the thing that we thought would win us approval, we realize that the goalpost keeps getting moved further and further and further and further away. There are some of us in this room who cannot wait for a uniquely valuable person to see us as uniquely valuable enough to marry them. There are people in this room who believe with all their heart that when they finally meet their soulmate, that the hole in their hearts will be filled forever. And I want to say this as a man who is married to an extraordinary woman, a woman who ticked every box that I ever had, a woman who has exceeded every expectation I could have had for a wife, a woman who, who has lived up to, to everything I could have hoped for, a woman who is godly, who is kind, who is caring, who is thoughtful, that even she could not fill the hole that I had in my heart that I put pressure on her to fill. Each of us have a desire deep in our hearts to have someone or something uniquely valuable tell us that we are uniquely valuable to them. So Isaac comes to Esau and he says, hey, let me bless you. Right? Now Esau is the one person who you could read through this story and he kind of comes out looking okay, right? Because like, what did Esau do wrong? So much. He gave away his birthright. He knew that. So he should have said to his dad, hey man, sorry, I had some soup a while ago and the, uh, you got the wrong guy. You know, the honorable thing to do would have, would have been to say, remind his dad, I gave my birthright up. You should not bless me. But he deceitfully thinks, maybe he thinks, oh, this guy's old. He forgot. Right? Maybe he forgot. Maybe this is my way back in. Right? The soup wasn't as good as I thought it was going to be. Like, it didn't give me what I wanted. So maybe he thinks he can deceive his way back in. When he should have been honest and said, hey, actually you should bless Jacob. Right? So Rebecca overhears all of this. Now Rebecca also has a favorite. And she does like the smooth guy. Okay? Her favorite is Jacob. You see, we've got a classic daddy's, daddy's boy, mommy's boy battle going on here. And so she, she... It, which is strange because she does want the will of God to come about, but when she hears Isaac scheming to change God's plan, instead of just trusting that, you know, God is going to make sure that his plan comes about, she decides, no, God can't do this. I'm going to take it into my own hands. Right? Instead of just, I don't know, having a conversation with Isaac, which, which we know is the mature thing to, hey, bro, 
Babe, I don't know what they called each other back in that day. I overheard that you're uh, trying to, you know, thwart God's will. You want to talk about that? But instead of talking to him, she's like, we're going to lie. And so she goes to Jacob and she says, hey, this is what's happening. They're going to steal your blessing, so we need to steal it back. So she says, I will cook the food. Oh, that's another thing I wanted to say. You know how Esau gave up his birthright for food? You see how, where he learned that from? His dad's willing to flip it all back for some food. Go and cook me some game. See? Like father, like son. Parents, let's be better for our kids. Okay. And so she goes to Jacob, and she, she says, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to make the food, because you suck at that. So just let me handle the cooking. We know Esau's the cook. You can't do it. Your dad will know straight away that you didn't make it, okay? Then what you need to do is find a way to get hairy, all right? So we're going to kill some things. We're going to put some, some hair on you. And then I'm going to dress you up like Esau, so that if you get close to your dad and he smells you, he'll still think you're Esau. Now, anyway, I mean, this, they put a lot of thought into this. Having a conversation would have been way easier. Okay, and so Jacob does all this. And I want us to take note of this. That this is what Jacob wanted his whole life. He wanted to hear his father approve of him and bless him, right? But he thought the only way that he could get his own father to bless him is by pretending to be someone else. Changed the way he dressed, changed the way he smelled, pretended to be someone that he wasn't. And so he does all of this, right? And it works. His father Isaac said to him, come near me and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelled the smell of his garments. Are they his garments? No. Smelled the smell of his garments, and there it is. He blessed him. Years and years and years and years of praying, of desperately seeking, of, of desperately doing everything he can to win the approval of his father. And finally, he hears it. See, the smell of my son is the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers. This is so crazy that Isaac is saying this because this is a literal reverse of what he knows God said to them. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. This was the culmination of Jacob's whole life. Everything that he wished for and hoped for, his dad was finally approving of him. Only one thing. How do you think it felt? hearing the words he's always wanted to hear, knowing that they're meant for someone else. Knowing that they're meant for someone else. Church, I want to implore all of us today, and we're going to get more into this as we move on. The more you try and pretend to be someone you're not, when people love you, you're going to know deep down it's not you that they love. When you try and, and I'm not just talking about dressing, but you know, we can all experiment. I'm wearing corduroy now. Like, we can try different things. When you try and be a different person to win the love and approval of valuable people in your life, and they do ultimately love that person, you're going to know deep down that it's not you that they love. And that desire to be loved is only going to get stronger and the chances of it happening are going to get weaker. And I'm telling you this as someone later on in life who spent all of my teenage years being a different person to everyone who I spoke to just so that they might love me a little bit, only to have to get caught out time and time again, getting caught out telling lies, getting caught out pretending to know things that I didn't know, getting caught out to pretend to like things that I have so many stories about foods that I ate that I didn't like and I was pretending to like them so that people would like me back. Super embarrassing when you're clearly got like, gog, like g gagging and they're like, do you like it? And you're like, uh, yeah. It's <laughs> pretending to be someone that I wasn't. 
And people really liked the person I pretended to be. And that broke my heart more than anything else. Because the person they loved was not who I really was. I hope this isn't coming across as a rebuke. My hope this afternoon is that it would be one broken person crying out to another, saying, I don't want you to feel what I felt. I don't want you to feel the crushing disappointment of having people love someone that's not you. My hope for all of us today is that when we do finally experience the love and approval that our hearts are longing for, that it's actually us that we're being approved of, that it's actually us who is receiving the love. And then he gets blessed. And then Esau comes back, <laughs> poor guy. And Esau's like, hey, dad, here's the food that I made you. And, he, and, and dad's like, hey, man, um, what's going on? I just blessed you. And Esau's like, mm-mm. And then we see something really chilling. Now, before I, before I dive into this, can I give you guys like some weird Bible reading advice? Advice is a bad word. Try it if you will. Like, if you're reading a narrative or a story, I have personally have found it's helpful to like, like do the voices of the... Don't laugh at me, okay? Like, like think like... Just do different voices for the different characters. Read it out loud. Try and really embody the story. Because sometimes when we do it that way, things hit us differently than they would if we just read it in our heads or whatever, right? So even if they have to be Scottish, whatever accent you're good at, all right? I would, I would encourage you to try that. Because there is this really crazy moment that we could miss, right, from Isaac. So his, his father said to him, who are you? And he answered, I'm your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently. And he said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came. And I, I have blessed him. Yeah. And he shall be blessed. He was trembling violently. Because in this moment, do you know what clicked for Isaac? Isaac came face to face with the kind of God that he was dealing with. Isaac came face to face with the fact that what God has decreed will come to be. Isaac has come face to face with the fact that no matter how hard humans try with our strength or with our cunning, no matter how hard humans try with our plans and our schemes, no matter how hard humans try even in our good intentions to try and bring about a will that God has not decreed himself, God will have his way. Yahweh, the creator of the universe, who has already decided the beginning from the end, who has already written the end, who knows how the story ends, who already has victory, who already chose that Jacob would be the one who would get the blessing, who knew that it was through the line of Jacob and not Esau that the Messiah would ultimately come and die on our behalf, giving us salvation, knowing that through the bloodline of Jesus that we would be grafted into, we would be ushered into a new history where everything would be made new. God knew that and he knew that it would happen the way that he decreed it to and Isaac came face to face with that in this moment. Isaac, as he says, and he shall be blessed, realized that God is in control and God will have his way. And I'm so thankful that God will have his way because I've tried with all my might to outrun God. I've tried with all my might to get off the path that he has called me onto. I've tried with everything I can to go the way of the world. And by the grace of God, he hasn't let me. Church, Jacob, in this story, and for the next couple of weeks is gonna prove himself to be one of the most unlikable people that you will ever read about in scripture. He has very, very few redeeming qualities. 
He's a liar. He's a schemer. He's a deceiver. He's weak. He's a coward. Jacob is one of the most unlikable people we will ever read about. And I'm so thankful that Jacob is one of the most unlikable people that we will ever read about. Because the truth is, without the grace of God, if I were to be left to my flesh, I'm one of the most likable, unlikable people you will ever meet. I'm a liar. I've told lies that have hurt people deeply. I'm prideful. When left to my own devices, it gets crazy, guys. I look down on people. I think less of people, not because of anything that they've done, but because it makes me feel good. Ravaged by lust. Greed. I can be really hateful at times. I can be mean. Can I be honest? Can, is this a safe place for me? I really enjoy gossiping. It makes me feel good. I love to gossip. As I look at Jacob and Rebecca and Isaac and Esau, it's hard for me to ignore that I'm, I'm not that different from them. But I'm really glad that I realized that I'm not that different from them because we read this glorious verse in Romans chapter 9 where Paul says this, But when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born, do you hear that? Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, had not yet been born, and therefore had done neither good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I loved. Before the foundations of the earth was laid, before they were born, before they could do good, and before they could do bad, before they could earn it, and before they could mess it up, God decreed in eternity past, Jacob, I have loved. He chose to love Jacob before he was born. He chose and determined that Jacob, I'm gonna love no matter how bad he is. I'm going to love Jacob no matter how unlikable he is. I'm going to love Jacob no matter how deceitful he is. I'm going to love Jacob no matter how broken he is. I'm going to love Jacob no matter how lustful he is, no matter how far away he strays from my purposes for him. He is going to be one of the worst sinners that we hear about in Scripture, but I am going to love him because I am God and I am good and I've chosen to. Church, you are not loved because you earned it. You are loved because before the foundations of the earth was laid, God decreed, Mitchell, have I loved? Luis, have I loved? Aiden, have I loved? Maria, have I loved? Melanie, and I forgot your name now. This would have been so much more powerful if I remembered it. Annie, 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 Abby. Oh, guys, I'm sorry, Abby. Abby. God is saying, from foundations old, I have loved you. The both Daniels, I have loved you. Judea, I have loved you. Alexis, I have loved you. Adonis, I have loved you. Karan, my brother, good to see you, man. Before the foundations of the earth was laid, I have loved you. This is the gospel. This is what we believe. We believe that, that no matter how bad it's gotten for you, no matter how many people you've slept with, no matter how many lies that you've told, no matter how much you've stolen, no matter how much you've broken, no matter who you've hurt, no matter how far you've strayed, no matter how disgusting you think you are in the eyes of a holy God, if he chose you, he will keep you because I have loved you. And this brings me back 
to this idea of a blessing. Because that's what this is all about, right? A blessing. What is a blessing according to Scripture? I think that the best way that we can understand what a blessing is in Scripture is the one we know, Numbers 6, 24 to 26. Man, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be <laughs> gracious, gracious, undeserved love to a people who've done everything they can not to deserve it, and yet God gives it anyway. To be blessed means to have the face of the Lord shine upon us and his grace to grab a hold of us so tightly that if we are blessed by him, we will be kept by him. This afternoon, if you do not know Jesus yet, I believe that he has you here today because he is pursuing you. I believe that he has you here today because he wanted you to hear this message. And I believe that he has you here today because he is calling you into this bloodline that he preserved through Jacob. That once you are grafted into, you are loved from the beginning and you will be loved to the end. And it is not because of anything you could do to earn it or lose it. It is given as a free gift. Because if you are in the family of God, he has loved you from before you were born, before you did good or bad. And he will love you until the very end, no matter how good or bad you were. So what can we learn about the gospel from this story? Well, the first thing that we realize, and we're going to speak more about this in a couple of weeks, is that Jacob was seeking approval from the wrong father. Jacob was seeking approval from the wrong father, even if Jacob came into the room as Jacob, and even if Isaac had blessed Jacob knowing it was Jacob, it would still fall short because the eternity-sized hole in his heart could only be filled by the approval of one father, and that is our Father in heaven. The truth is the only words that could fill the eternity-shaped hole in our heart are these words. This is my son or my daughter in whom I am well pleased. The only words that we could hear from the God of the universe that, that could fill that hole that we have in our hearts is this. This is my son or my daughter in whom I am well pleased. But we've just spent a long time, and I'm sorry about that, but we've just spent a long time talking about how undeserving we are, right? How can we hear from God that this is my son or daughter in whom I am well pleased? Well, that leads us to the second thing that we learn about the gospel Jacob wore the clothes of the wrong brother. Jacob wore the clothes of the wrong brother. We read in Scripture, we read in Romans 8, 29 to 30, For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers. We read that unlike Esau, Jesus didn't despise his birthright, but he so loved his birthright that he did exactly what his birthright called him to do. In Luke 15, we see the older brother get mad when the younger brother comes home, right? You know that in that culture, the older brother was actually his job to go and fetch the younger brother when he ran away and reconcile him to his father. Jesus so loved and took seriously his birthright that he left his space in the heavens with the father to come and rescue and redeem a people who had left and run away, the younger brothers and sisters who squandered everything that our father had offered us. He left behind because of how seriously he took his birthright. Unlike Esau, Jesus doesn't flippantly give away his birthright, but he shed his own blood to share it with us that we too might become a people who receive the blessing of the firstborn through the shedding of the blood of Jesus. But this is what we need to hear, that Jacob should not have dressed up like Esau. He should have looked forward to the day that he would have been dressed up like Jesus. Jesus came to earth and he dressed up like us. 
and he took on flesh and he put our sin onto himself so that he could go to the cross that we deserved to be crucified on for our sin and our brokenness. And he died the death that we deserved to die for our sin. And he went into the grave that we should have been buried and separated from the Father. But three days later, Jesus arose from the grave, resurrected in glory, leaving sin, shame, and death dead in the grave. And he arose with his arms open wide so that anyone who runs to him might be covered in a cloak of his righteousness. Jesus dressed up like us so that we could be dressed up like him. And so let us not be like Jacob trying to dress up like other people in the world. Let's dress up like the correct brother And let us come to Jesus and say, I have nothing to offer. Will you put your cloak of righteousness over me?